Why do you seem so scared? All I wanted to do was play with you. Please come and play with me. <laughs> I'm so lonely. You're not afraid of the dark, are you? <laughs> Don't be afraid. Come with me. I will show you where I play hide and seek. Do you want to play hide and seek? You hide and I'll find you. <laughs> It's rare when I talk about myself on this podcast. I am making an exception for the introduction of this episode. I have experienced bullying firsthand. It went on for years, from elementary through high school. I had a weight problem, so I was on the receiving end of bullying that destroyed my self-esteem and left me to struggle with depression and social anxiety. I was viciously ostracized which ranged from being directly excluded from peer groups to outright insults and ridicule. In junior high, I was at a dance and a guy offered to ask a girl to dance for me. I didn't realize he was playing a prank on me. When he showed me to the girl, she and a group of her friends all laughed at me. That same year, I wasn't getting good grades because I moved from another province whose school curriculum had not proceeded at the same pace, so I was behind everybody else, and as a result, my grade point average plummeted. One day a kid called me stupid when he learned about this. It was like a knife in my heart. I have never recovered from that. To this day, if somebody calls me stupid, or a synonym of stupid, it is deeply upsetting. One day in a grade 9 class, I was in a group that was asked to say what came to mind when other group members' names were mentioned. When my name was mentioned, one member simply said, Fat. Other group members laughed at this. I was humiliated. I wanted to leave the room. Because of gynecomastia, I was told by other males that I had bigger tits than their girlfriends. This resulted in a nervous habit of tugging at my shirt to make it appear roomier. I didn't drop this habit until I was in my 20s. It wasn't just kids who were responsible for the bullying. On my 15th birthday, I was on my way home from the store when a bunch of white trash in a Trans Am pulled up at an intersection and a girl said, go on a diet. My self-esteem was so low, I even let my own friends verbally abuse me. I still struggle with mental health issues today because of the bullying. Bullying is abuse. I am a victim of it, so I know what I'm talking about. It was traumatic. Years of this trauma took a toll, and I still haven't recovered. A few years ago, during Christmas, a man on the street called me a fat fuck. A lot of emotions kicked up. It took me a few days to get over that one. In retrospect, I wish I had punched him in the head, but there's nothing to be done now. Bullying at any age can leave someone feeling humiliated, helpless, and lonely. Sometimes it taints your entire outlook on life and humanity. In this episode, I profile people, mostly teenagers, who committed suicide because they were unable to cope with the pain of being a bullying victim. I wasn't suicidal as a teenager, but as an adult, I have lived with suicidal ideation for many years. I don't have concrete plans to follow through with suicide, but I have no love for life, I can assure you. I am glad that schools are addressing bullying now, 
and have even created programs to educate young people about the consequences. I don't know how effective these programs are, but I'm glad they exist. My heart breaks for the children who have taken their own lives because they were targets for bullying. I also hurt for their families. No parent wants their child to suffer for any reason. And to know that their child was beaten, condemned verbally, and subjected to other cruel and humiliating treatment must be deeply hurtful. As a bullying victim, I was lucky in one respect. I attended school before the age of social media. Cyberbullying has made bullying worse because the perpetrators can use the cloak of anonymity to hurt others. One of the aspects of bullying that always troubles me is that it is always the kindest, most sensitive, and considerate kids who are targeted. Kids don't rally together to get rid of a bully. The bullies are popular, part of the in crowd. And it doesn't end after high school graduation either. It can happen in the workplace and even in the home in the form of domestic violence. Unfortunately, children are the most vulnerable targets since they are fragile and, due to their hunger for approval from their peers, they are most likely to ingest and believe the negative propaganda they are fed regarding themselves. If you are a parent and you become aware your child is being bullied, you must act. If their behavior or disposition has taken a turn for the worst, serious damage has been done to their mental health and they should undergo counseling so that they can be deprogrammed from believing the worst about themselves. The people profiled in this episode should serve as a warning of how it can all go wrong if their suffering does not receive the appropriate reaction. Bullies are not only cruel, but devoid of empathy for their victims, and in some cases, even encourage them to kill themselves. If your child is a bully, and it is brought to your attention, you owe it to your community to correct this behavior, because sometimes the consequences are fatal. This kind of suicide is now called bully-side. Here are some individual cases. Jared High, May 6, 1998, 4.45 p.m. Jared High, a 12-year-old grade 6 student, was in the gym of McLaughlin Middle School, located in Washington State. He made a phone call to his older brother to pick him up after sports practice. Once the call was completed, Jared took a few steps before noticing Cole, a pseudonym, who was well known as the school's bully. Jared made a beeline for the gym's exit. Cole gave him what Jared described as the evil eye. Cole grabbed Jared by his shirt, preventing him from leaving. Cole looked around to ensure there were no adults around. He then said to Jared, What are you going to do about it now? It being a reference to the fact that they were alone with no adults to protect Jared. Jared later told insurance investigators for the Pasco School District that he knew he was about to be beaten up. Cole picked Jared up. He threw and pushed him against the walls. When Jared fell to the ground, Cole kicked and punched him in the stomach and shoulders. Desperate for mercy, Jared yelled, Teacher! Teacher! Nobody was around to come to his aid. Cole was a very large 8th grader. He was often referred to as fat with muscles. He weighed approximately 175 pounds. Jared weighed about 98 pounds and was 6 inches shorter. Cole had a long history of bullying younger and smaller children. He was once reported to police because of this behavior. Three weeks before the incident with Jared, Cole knocked a smaller boy named John to the floor with a running, flying karate kick in his chest. It happened in the same gym where Jared was assaulted. When he bullied John, there were witnesses, including John's mother. When Cole was informed that John's mother was watching, he advanced toward her threateningly 
and grabbed his crotch as an obscene gesture. John's mother interpreted this as an insult typical of gang members, and she reported both this gesture and the assault of her son to the school's authorities and to the police. The police also questioned Cole about the incident. Cole claimed that John threw the first punch. Nothing was done to correct Cole's behavior, and eventually the incident was swept under the rug. When Cole assaulted Jared, it went on for about eight minutes. Cole took breaks, once going to get a drink of water from a fountain. He would come back and assault him again. He tried to empty the contents of his backpack. He followed Jared outside and slammed him against a brick wall a few times. Members of Cole's gang witnessed this and encouraged Cole. Later, they labeled Jared as a wimp and felt he deserved the assault. The attack was completely unprovoked on Jared's part. He didn't even call Cole any names. Cole called Jared faggot several times. Cole threatened to kill Jared. The school did not take these death threats seriously. Jared managed to kick Cole twice out of self-defense, but he was no match for his bully. When Jared's brother finally came by to pick him up, Jared began to cry. His brother confronted Cole, leading to an altercation. The school was more concerned that Jared's brother beat Cole up than they were about the ways in which Jared was victimized. Jared was interrogated by a vice principal who was known to bully students in his own right when there were no parents or other adults around. He interviewed both Jared and Cole in the same room. Jared barely said a word since Cole threatened to kill him the day before. In fear for his life, Jared lied and said the attack was partially his fault. The vice principal suspended them both from school for three days for fighting. On May 7th, Cole called Jared's home to challenge Jared's older brother to what he called a real fight. A photo was taken of the information on the caller ID screen. On May 8th, Jared's mother filed a police report with a county deputy, asking them to press charges against Cole. This followed a visit to Jared's chiropractor, whose results shocked her. After looking at x-ray results, the chiropractor said, It looks like he's been through a major car accident. She was aware of the impact on Jared's mental health, which took its toll on his body, leading him to develop insomnia. The chiropractor informed her that if Jared had been slammed into the brick wall one more time, his neck would have been broken and he would have died. Much trauma was dealt to Jared's neck, shoulders, hips, and spine. The county deputy classified the crime as an assault. Jared visited his family doctor. The doctor diagnosed his emergent vomiting problem as having been caused by repeated punches and or kicks to the stomach. There were other health-related complications. He was extremely sore, had diarrhea, and he had no appetite. Jared began to hear voices in his head. He developed low self-esteem, one cause for which was the blame his schools placed on him for the assault. Essentially, the school's administration considered him to be to blame, like Cole's gang did. This despite the fact that Cole's history of bullying was well documented, not just in school files, but by the police. They did this to avoid compensating Jared's family for the chiropractor bills. The impact on Jared's mental health worsened. He developed chronic depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and an overall feeling of worthlessness. At one point, it was all too much for him to bear, and he took his life on September 29, 1998. Before doing so, he called his father and said, simply, Dad, I called to say goodbye. Without hanging up, he shot himself. Hope Witzel Hope was 13 years old and lived in Sundance, Florida. Her troubles with bullying began when she forwarded a nude photo to a boy she liked. 
When another girl borrowed his phone, she found the image and forwarded it to other students. Soon after, students began to bully Hope with insults like whore and slut. At the time, Hope wrote this entry in her journal. Tons of people talk about me behind my back, and I hate it because they call me a whore, and I can't be a whore. I'm too inexperienced. So secretly, tons of people hate me. School authorities discovered the new photo near the end of the school year and suspended Hope for the first week of grade 8. When she returned to school, a counselor saw cuts on Hope's legs. They had her sign a no-harm contract. Had she honored this contract, she would have told an adult if she were tempted to hurt herself. A day later, she hung herself in her bedroom. This is another entry in Hope's journal, dated September 12, 2009. I'm done for sure now. I can feel it in my stomach. I'm going to try and strangle myself. I hope it works. Rita Parsons Rita lived in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada. She was 17 years old. In November 2011, she went with a friend to another friend's home. While there, she was raped by four teenage boys. They were drinking vodka as an impromptu party. Rita didn't remember much from the event, except that she vomited while a boy was raping her. The gang rape was documented with a photo, which was widely disseminated in Rita's school and throughout her town in three days. Many of her peers at school called her a slut. She received text and Facebook messages from people asking her for sex. The rape went unreported for several days. Finally, she broke down and told her parents. They contacted an emergency health team and the police. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police conducted an investigation and decided there was insufficient evidence to press charges. The rapists were not questioned and their phones were not reviewed. The RCMP wrote it off as a case of he said, she said. The only charge that was laid was pressed when one of the rapists was 20. He pleaded guilty to a charge of producing child pornography, since Rita was a minor at the time the photo was taken. He received a year of probation. Rita attempted suicide by hanging at her home on April 7, 2013. She didn't die immediately. She went into a coma, but she was not expected to live, so she was taken off life support. The government of Nova Scotia responded to her legacy by enacting a law in August 2013 that would enable victims to seek protection from cyberbullying and to sue the perpetrator. Rita had a tattoo on her upper right arm in Chinese characters that stood for strength and courage. Tyler Clementi Tyler was 18 years old and lived in Manhattan, New York. He was gay and came out of the closet to his parents a few days before leaving for university. His father was supportive. Clementi told a friend in an instant message that his mother had basically completely rejected him. His mother would later say she was sad and quiet as she digested this information. She also said she felt a little betrayed that he had not told her he was gay before then. She was a member of an evangelical church that strongly condemned homosexuality, and she was not ready to publicly acknowledge that she had a gay son. They settled the matter after discussing it, whereupon they cried, hugged, and said they loved each other. According to his mother, he was confident and comfortable after coming out. Tyler had a roommate in college named Ravi. Ravi did online research on Tyler and found out about his involvement with a website for young gay men called Just Us Boys. Ravi tweeted, Found out my roommate is gay. Tyler read this tweet before he moved in. The two boys rarely interacted, mostly keeping to themselves. 
Ravi put together a private changing area for himself, to Tyler's amusement. Nevertheless, Tyler appreciated that Ravi kept to himself. On the nights of September 19th and the 21st, Tyler asked Ravi if he could have the room to himself. On the first night, Ravi met Tyler's male friend. Tyler said they wanted to be alone for the evening. Concerned about theft, Ravi left his computer's webcam on to document whatever went on. Witnesses later testified that Ravi was spying on Tyler, anxious to prove he was gay. Ravi and a friend named Wei watched the video on iChat for a few seconds. They observed Tyler and his guest kissing. Ravi left the room, but Wei turned the camera on for another view with four other people in the room. This group watched Tyler and his guest kissing with their shirts off and their pants still on. On the 20th, Tyler read a tweet by Ravi that went, Roommate asked for the room till midnight. I went into Molly's room and turned on my webcam. I saw him making out with a dude. Yay. On the 21st, Tyler sent an email to a university employee making a request for a single room because his roommate used a webcam to spy on him. On the 21st, Ravi posted text messages announcing a viewing party to watch Tyler with his guest. It included instructions on how to view it remotely. At 6.39 p.m., Ravi tweeted, Anyone with iChat, I dare you to video chat me between the hours of 9.30 and 12. Yes, it's happening again. Ravi set up the webcam and pointed it at Tyler's bed. Tyler noticed this and unplugged Ravi's power strip. Ravi canceled the broadcast and put the computer in sleep mode. Tyler sent an email to a resident's assistant. This is a quote from that email which described Ravi's behavior. I feel that my privacy has been violated and I am extremely uncomfortable sharing a room with someone who would act in this wildly inappropriate manner. Tyler felt deeply humiliated and hurt. On the evening of September 22nd, he left his room, had dinner at the campus food court, and at 6.30 p.m. walked to the George Washington Bridge. By 8.42 p.m., he posted on Facebook with his cell phone, the following message. Jumping off the GW Bridge. Sorry. Tyler left a suicide note. His body was found on the 29th in the Hudson River. The cause of death as determined by the coroner was drowning with blunt impact injuries to the torso. Tyler's alma mater, Rutgers University, observed a Black Friday event which commemorated and memorialized Tyler. The school's president said, We grieve for him and for his family, friends, and classmates as they deal with the tragic loss of a gifted young man. In 2012, Rutgers introduced new programs to create a safer and more inclusive environment for LGBT students. On March 16, 2012, Ravi was convicted for his role in the webcam spying incidents. He was sentenced to 30 days in jail, 3 years of probation, 300 hours of community service, a $10,000 fine, and counseling on cyberbullying and alternative lifestyles. Tyler's mother, Jane Clementi, made this statement. In this digital world, we need to teach our youngsters that their actions have consequences that their words have real power to hurt or help. They must be encouraged to choose to build people up and not to tear them down. Amanda Todd Amanda lived in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, Canada. She was 15 years old. When she was in grade 7 between 2009 and 2010, which was around the time when she moved in with her father, she used video chat to meet new people online. She received compliments on her looks, and she was flattered. A stranger chatted with her, and he kept pressuring her to pose topless. This practice has come to be known as capping, short for screen capturing. 
His tone grew sinister after she was persuaded. He threatened to give the topless photo to her friends unless she gave him what he referred to as a show. During Christmas of 2010, at 4 a.m., she was notified by the police that the topless photo was being distributed throughout the Internet. This caused her a great deal of turmoil, and she suffered anxiety, depression, and panic disorder. After her family moved to another home, she began to abuse drugs and alcohol. A year later, the blackmailer reappeared. He created a Facebook profile that used the topless photo as its user pick. He contacted her classmates, sending them the picture. Amanda was bullied as a result, and she changed schools for a second time. She later chatted with a boy she used to know. He invited her over to his house. They had sex there while his girlfriend was away on vacation. A week later, the boy's girlfriend and a group of 15 other kids confronted Amanda at school. They insulted her, and the boy's girlfriend punched Amanda, sending her into a ditch, which was where her father found her. Following this incident, Amanda attempted suicide by drinking bleach. She survived after she was rushed to the hospital to have her stomach pumped. Remarking on how this affected her, she said, It killed me inside, and I thought I was actually going to die. After she returned home, Amanda discovered that abusive messages about her suicide attempt were posted on Facebook. In March 2012, her family moved to another city for a fresh start. Unfortunately, Amanda was not able to escape the bullying. To quote her mother, Every time she moved schools, he would go undercover and become a Facebook friend. What the guy did was he went online to the kids who went to the new school and said he, that he was going to be a new student, that he was starting school the following week, and that he wanted some friends, and could they friend him on Facebook. He eventually gathered people's names and sent Amanda's video to her new school, and that included not just students, but faculty and parents. Six months later, more messages and abuse were being posted to social networking sites. Amanda's mental health grew progressively worse, and she began to engage in self-mutilation and cutting. She was prescribed antidepressants and underwent counseling, but she overdosed and was hospitalized for two days. She was also bullied at school for her low grades. It was due to a language-based learning disability. They also taunted her for spending time in hospital to treat her severe depression. To quote her mother, It didn't really help that after she got out of the hospital recently, some kids started calling her psycho and saying she had been in the crazy hospital. She went to the hospital, she had therapy, she had counseling, she was on a good track. On the day she gets out, that happens. I shake my head and I think, are kids really that nasty? Do they really not think, what if it was them? Amanda attended school at CABE Secondary in Coquitlam, which accommodates the needs of students who have social or behavioral issues. October 10th, 2012, 6 p.m., Amanda was found hanging in her home. It was discovered that the RCMP were notified that Amanda was being exploited sexually online by an adult male, but they did nothing about it. Facebook's security unit conducted an investigation and forwarded their report to the American Child Exploitation and Online Protection Center, as well as the British National Crime Agency, and finally to authorities in the Netherlands. In January 2014, Dutch police arrested a man who had sextorted other victims. He installed spyware in his computer. His hard drive also contained images of child pornography and 5,800 bookmarked names of potential victims and their social media accounts. He was charged with indecent assault and possession of child pornography. Some of the child pornography charges were dropped. He was slapped with 72 charges of sexual assault and extortion in the Netherlands, which involved 39 alleged victims, 
34 females and 5 males in a wide range of territory, including Britain, Canada, Norway, and the United States. Some of them he harassed for years. His sentence in Holland was 10 years and 8 months. He insisted he was innocent. Before taking her own life, Amanda made a video about her experiences with bullying and posted it on YouTube. It has been viewed over 14 million times. It is still available to be viewed. Her Facebook memorial page received 1 million likes. Sadly, some of her former peers posted attacks and other offensive material to the page. One man's derogatory Facebook comment about her death was reported to his employer and he was terminated. Jamie Rodemeyer Jamie was a 14-year-old high school student who lived in Amherst, New York. Jamie was openly gay and became an activist against homophobic bullying. He also created videos on YouTube to help victims of said bullying. Jamie was bullied because of his sexual orientation. He was inspired to help others with this plight by Lady Gaga, whom he greatly admired. He mentioned her frequently in his videos, even to the point of quoting her lyrics. Jamie had an account at a website called Formspring. Hate messages were posted there about him. Among them were, Jamie is stupid, gay, fat, and ugly. He must die. I wouldn't care if you died. No one would. So just do it. It would make everyone way more happier. Jamie did not allow this abuse to deter him at first. He even got involved with the It Gets Better project, which was devised to prevent suicides among LGBT youth. September 18, 2011. Jamie's sister Alyssa found him in the backyard of their home. He had hung himself. Before he took his life, he posted a tweet directed at Lady Gaga, which read, Lady Gaga, by Mother Monster, thank you for all you have done. Pause up forever. The bullying didn't stop after Jamie's death. His parents and his siblings were still being harassed by Jamie's homophobic peers. When his sister attended a homecoming dance, Jamie's friends chanted his name during a Lady Gaga song. The same bullies who harassed him started chanting that they were glad he was dead. Lady Gaga commented on his death, saying she was extremely upset and spent her days reflecting, crying, and yelling. At a performance at the iHeart Radio Music Festival, she dedicated her song, Hair, to Jamie. Before launching into the song, she said, I wrote this record about how your identity is really all you've got when you're in school. So tonight, Jamie, I know you're up there looking at us, and you're not a victim. You're a lesson to all of us. I know it's a bit of a downer, but sometimes the right thing is more important than the music. Megan Tyler Meyer Megan was 13 years old and lived in Darden Prairie, Missouri. She was a troubled girl, telling her mother from grade 3 onwards she wanted to kill herself. She was treated by a psychiatrist. She was prescribed Cytolopram, one of whose side effects is suicidal ideation in young patients. She also took methylphenidate and the atypical antipsychotic Ziprazidone. She was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and depression. She had low self-esteem because of her weight. Despite all this, she was described by her parents as a bubbly, goofy girl. She enjoyed spending time with her friends and family. At middle school, Megan befriended the popular girls in hopes that boys who bullied her would stop. The girls turned on Megan and the bullying was worse than ever. Her parents withdrew her and placed her in a Catholic school. Megan created an account on MySpace. She received a message from someone who identified as a 16-year-old boy named Josh. They became friends, 
but never met in person or spoke on the phone. Megan thought Josh was attractive. Their exchanges lifted her spirits, as her family has said. Josh said he moved to a city nearby, was homeschooled, and didn't have a phone number. The truth about Josh was that the account was created by Lori Drew, mother of Sarah Drew, who was a former friend of Megan's. They were neighbors, living four doors apart. The adult, Lori Drew, was assisted by her daughter, Sarah, and by Ashley Grills, another adult who worked for Lori. At some point, others joined in. Both adults and children were bullying Megan Meyer. Their intention was to get information about Megan to humiliate her. Their motivation was that Megan was alleged to have spread gossip about Drew's daughter. October 16, 2006. The tone of the messages from Josh grew dark. One of them read, I don't know if I want to be friends with you anymore because I've heard that you are not very nice to your friends. Messages of a similar nature were sent to her. One read, Everybody in O'Fallon knows who you are. You are a bad person, and everybody hates you. Have a shitty rest of your life. The world would be a better place without you. Megan's response, You're the kind of boy a girl would kill herself over. They had their final conversation over AOL Messenger. She went upstairs and ran into her father, Ron. She told him about her troubles with Josh and went to her room. Afterwards, Ron went downstairs and discussed the cyberbullying with his wife as they made dinner. Twenty minutes later, Tina Meyer froze in mid-sentence and ran up to Megan's room. Megan hung herself with a belt in her bedroom's closet. Attempts were made to revive her, but she was pronounced dead the next day. Lori Drew was not prosecuted, but she was shunned by friends, neighbors, and potential clients of her business. Nicola Ann Raphael Nicola was a 15-year-old student from Glasgow, Scotland, she was bullied because she dressed in fashions typical of the goth subculture. She committed suicide on June 24, 2001. She overdosed on her mother's corpoximal painkillers. She did not wake the following day and was pronounced dead hours later. Nicola was looking forward to attending a concert by one of her favorite musicians, Marilyn Manson. She was buried with the ticket. Manson dedicated the performance of The Fight Song to Nicola. After the concert, Manson met with Nicola's mother. To quote her mother, Rona, He was very caring and considerate. I was so touched that this megastar took time out to meet me. Despite all the controversy about him and his shows, he just seemed like a normal man to me. Brody Panlock. This is a case when an adult experienced bullying in the workplace. Brody lived in Victoria, Australia. She was 19 years old. She worked at a cafe called Cafe Vamp. Co workers have described her as a loyal employee, buoyant, chirpy, compassionate, patient, and giving. Her long range career goal was to become a social worker. Things took a dark turn for her at the cafe. She became intimate with the manager, Nicholas Smallwood, throughout the last 15 months of her life. Brody became infatuated with him, but these feelings were not reciprocal. The situation got worse when Nicholas, in collaboration with other employees, bullied her emotionally and physically. Nicholas Waiter Rees McAlpine and Chef Gabriel Toomey called her names. They would tell her she was fat, ugly, and a whore. They would kick and spit on her. Other times, they would hold her down and pour oil on her hair and clothes. That, or they would cover her in chocolate sauce and fill her tote bag with fish oil. 
Other co-workers defended her, but it did not stop the bullying. The owner of the cafe, Marcus de la Cruz, turned a blind eye to the bullying. After Brody was kicked out of Nicholas's apartment, she swallowed rat poison with alcohol as a suicide attempt. Nicholas taunted her for it, saying she couldn't do it properly. He would put rat poison in her handbag. One day, Nicholas left her apartment after she begged him to stay. She called a friend named Ashley. She was crying hysterically and told her she felt she made a fool of herself. Ashley recalled her saying, How embarrassing. I want to die. Ash, it is over. I have had enough. It's over. Unable to cope any longer, Brody jumped from the top of a multi-level car park and died from her injuries three days later. The staff of Cafe Vamp, who terrorized Brody, were charged with offenses under the Occupational Health and Safety Act of 2004. They pleaded guilty and paid steep fines. Nicholas Smallwood's fine was $45,000. Hamid Bismel Nasto. Hamid lived in Burnaby, British Columbia, Canada, and was 14 years old. Hamid was remembered for being intelligent, with a penchant for horror movies, reading, dancing, and music. In his suicide note, he described to his parents the bullying to which he was subjected by his peers at school. They would call him names like gay, fag, queer, four eyes, and big nose. In his suicide note, he wrote to his parents, I hate myself for doing this to you. I really, really hate myself. But there is no other way out. On March 11, 2000, he went to the Petulo Bridge and jumped to his death. He wore a backpack filled with rocks to add extra weight and ensure he would drown. He died from blunt trauma after his eye hit a rock in the water at 108 kilometers an hour. This incident inspired the provincial government of British Columbia to create a homosexuality issues course for high school, which is part of the elective curriculum. Hamid's mother, Nasima formed the Hamid Nastos Anti-Bullying Coalition to raise awareness of the consequences of bullying in elementary and high schools. It also provides support to parents of bullied children. Her stated message is, Suicide is not the solution. Seek help. If you don't talk about it, nobody can hear. Ryan Halligan Ryan was 13 years old and a citizen of Essex Junction, Vermont. He was described by his father as a gentle, very sensitive soul. Ryan experienced some developmental delays that affected his speech and physical coordination in his early years at school. He overcame these challenges. To quote his father, he still struggled. School was never easy to him, but he always showed up with a smile on his face, eager to do his best. During the 2000-2001 school year, Ryan a grade 5 student at this time, began to experience bullying. He was singled out for mistreatment because of his learning disability, his passion for music, he played drums and guitar, and his love of the dramatic arts. When he told his father about the bullying, his father told him to ignore them, since it consisted only of verbal abuse. Ryan underwent counseling, but it was not effective. The bullying continued, when Ryan was in middle school. He told his father the bullying started up again. Ryan asked for a Taibo kickboxing set for Christmas so he could learn how to defend himself. His father wanted to meet with the school's principal to sort the problem out, but Ryan insisted on learning how to fight. He felt that informing on the bullies would only make things worse. After Christmas, Ryan and his father practiced Taibo for two hours every night. After mastering kickboxing techniques, his father cautioned him to never start fights, to only defend himself. His father told him that if anybody attacked him physically, he had his permission to defend himself. 
In February, Ryan had a fight with a bully, which was broken up by the assistant principal. That bully stopped harassing Ryan. Ryan's father was proud. Toward the end of the school year, Ryan and that bully became friends. The friendship did not last long. Ryan told the boy about an embarrassing medical examination that was required after he experienced pains in his stomach. The bully distorted this information when spreading a rumor about Ryan, telling everyone he was gay. The homophobic bullying was ceaseless at school. On one occasion, he ran out of a classroom in tears. The bullying also occurred in perpetuity online. Ryan developed a romantic attachment to a girl named Ashley, with whom he chatted on AOL Instant Messenger. She later told him she was lying when she told him she liked him. She then called him a loser. She had been his friend in the past, and even defended him against bullies. But when she became more popular, she distanced herself from him to the point where she rejected him altogether. To make matters worse, she only got close to him to learn personal information about him, which she used to humiliate him at school. After she called him a loser, he said, It's girls like you who make me want to kill myself. Ryan had been discussing suicide with another boy online and confessed that he was considering it himself. When he told the boy he was serious about it, the boy said, Phew, it's about fucking time. Ryan had been friends with this boy until grade three. They reconnected years later. This friend had a very bleak and misanthropic worldview. He and Ryan would talk about how much they hated the popular kids at school and how they made them feel. The friend suggested suicide as an ideal escape route, writing, If you killed yourself, you would really make them feel bad. Ryan was also worried about his father's reaction to his report card. October 7, 2003 While his father was away on a business trip and the rest of his family were sleeping, Ryan hung himself in his closet with a bathrobe tie. His father went through Ryan's computer and his yearbook. The faces of the bullies were scribbled out. He scribbled over the face of the boy who started the gay rumor so much he tore the paper. Ashley was blamed for his suicide. Ryan's father had her over to their house. He said to her, You did a bad thing, but you're not a bad person. She expressed remorse and even appeared with Ryan's father on an episode of ABC's Prime Time. Ryan's father confronted the boy who started the gay rumor after he discovered he made fun of the way Ryan hung himself. Ryan's father drove to his house wanting to, quote, crush that little jerk, but thought better of it while stuck in traffic. His father said to the boy, you have no idea the amount of pain you caused my son, and you're still bullying him now, even when he's defenseless, and you are still lying to your parents about it. I refuse to believe that you are so cruel and that you don't have a heart. The boy broke down in tears and apologized to his father repeatedly. Ryan's father forgave him and Ashley. He lobbied for Vermont to enact new legislation to address bullying and suicide prevention. Audrey Pott Audrey was 15 years old and a resident of Saratoga, California. On September 3, 2012, she went to a party with about 10 friends. She drank hard liquor at the party until she became heavily inebriated. After she became drunk, she was dragged up the stairs to a bedroom. Three or more boys raped her there. They also drew and wrote on her body with markers. From there, photos were taken and distributed through the internet to their network of friends. Audrey was bullied once the photos went into circulation. Mortified, she hung herself on September 12th. An investigation was conducted, and three teenaged boys were charged with sexual battery. A 13-year-old girl was added as a defendant, as she was alleged to have been present during the incident and lied about it later to cover it up. 
The three boys pleaded guilty to sexual assault and possessing the photos, which are considered child pornography by the law. Two of them received 30-day sentences, which they served on weekends. The other was sentenced to 45 consecutive days. Due to having been minors at the time, they were not publicly identified. Their identities were released later. Audrey's parents filed a civil case. A settlement was reached before it went to trial. The terms of the settlement were as follows. The boys were to apologize in open court, admit once again to having committed the sexual assault, acknowledge their role in Audrey's death, and be filmed in a documentary. A sum of $950,000 was to be paid in support of an honorary diploma for Audrey. They were to then give 10 presentations on rape and sexting. Kenneth Weishan Kenneth was 14 years old and a resident of Pringar, Iowa. A month before his suicide, he came out publicly as gay. Not only was he bullied in person, but death threats were sent to his cell phone. A Facebook hate group was created solely for the purpose of condemning Kenneth. The bullying was described as aggressive, merciless, and overwhelming. Unable to cope with the trauma, Kenneth hung himself in his family's garage on April 15, 2012. Kenneth's mother was unsure about whether or not to press charges. She was quoted as saying, I really don't want to ruin somebody else's life or take someone else's son or daughter from them. But I don't know what it's going to take to get it to stop. Kenneth's sister Kayla was not only traumatized by Kenneth's death, but she had to attend school with the bullies throughout the rest of her time in high school. Jaden Bell Jaden was 15 years old and lived in Portland, Oregon. He was intensely bullied for being gay, both in person and on the internet. By January 19th, 2013, the harassment became too much for him to bear, and he hung himself from a piece of playground equipment at a local elementary school. He was injured by the strangulation, but did not perish right away. He was rushed to an emergency triage, where he was put on life support. He was taken off life support on February 3rd and died shortly thereafter. Jaden's death received a great deal of media focus, and it drew the spotlight to the issue of the bullying that is suffered by LGBT youth. In a statement to the media, his father was quoted as saying, He was hurting so bad, just the bullying at school. Yeah, there were other issues, but ultimately it was all due to the bullying, for not being accepted for being gay. Oregon-based LGBT activist Alex Horsey said, Sometimes it can be easy to become disconnected to so many stories like Jaden's in the media. Every story has equal importance. It's heartbreaking that Jaden's story has become a reminder of the horrifying consequences of bullying, rather than a story of a young man overcoming adversity and a community changing its ways. Kelly Yeomans Kelly was 13 years old and lived in the town of Allenton in England. Kelly has been described as a pleasant and friendly girl. She was subjected to repeated harassment and ridicule, with emphasis placed on her weight. The bullying took a toll on her mental health, leading her to become deeply depressed. Her mother went to the school 30 times to complain, but the school did not act. The school has claimed to have only received one complaint. The bullying intensified in September 1997. A group of youths congregated outside of her house and hurled projectiles at it, throwing eggs, margarine, butter, cakes, and mud, all the while making fun of Kelly. Soon after, Kelly said to her family, It has nothing to do with you, Daddy, nothing to do with you, Mummy, and nothing to do with you, Sarah, her sister. I have had enough, and I'm going to take an overdose. 
Her parents were worried about her, but did not take the suicide threat seriously. However, they soon found Kelly dead in her bedroom. She took an overdose of Coproximal, a painkiller her mother was taking. Five youths confessed to having harassed Kelly in the months leading to her death. They were sentenced to attendance center orders. Slajana Vidovic Slajana was 16 years old and lived in Mentor, Ohio. She was born in Croatia. Slajana was remembered for being pretty, energetic, and charming. She liked to dance. She would turn on her CD player, drag her father out of his chair, and they would dance in circles together. Circumstances were not nearly as pleasant for her at school. She was mocked for her thick accent. She was insulted with names like Slutty Jana and Slut Jana Vagina. A boy once pushed her down the stairs. Because he was a member of the school's uppermost echelon of athletic achievers, he was not punished. A girl smacked her in the face with a water bottle. Slajana would receive prank calls at night from people who would tell her to go back to Croatia. Otherwise, she would be dead by the following morning or would be tracked down at school. Jelena, a friend of Slajana's, was quoted as saying, Slajana did stand up for herself, but toward the end, she just kind of stopped because she couldn't handle it. She didn't have enough strength. Slajana wrote a four-page suicide note. In the note, she detailed the bullying she suffered, everything from being criticized for her accent, being called a slut and a whore, and being slandered for dating an unpopular boy. The bullies would also throw foods and beverages at her during the lunch period. October 2nd, 2008, Slajana tied one end of a rope around her neck and the other around a bedpost. She hung herself by jumping out her bedroom window. The bullies attended her funeral and made fun of the way her body looked in her coffin. They went on MySpace afterwards and commented that the clothes in which she was attired were ugly. Dawn Marie Wesley Dawn Marie was 14 years old and lived in Mission, British Columbia. She was singled out for psychological torture and verbal threats by three female classmates, Kyla Mae Dunn, Donna Harley, and Darla Wilson. These names were mentioned in her suicide note. Her body was found by her 13-year-old brother who went to her room to call her down to dinner. Dawn Marie hung herself with her cat's leash. This is a quote from her suicide note. If I try to get help, it will get worse. They are always looking for a new person to beat up, and these are the toughest girls. If I ratted, they would get expelled from school, and there would be no stopping them. I love you all so much. The case received international attention and set a legal precedent. It was the first time in Canadian history that teenaged defendants were made to stand trial for bullying. Two of them pleaded guilty to their role in the suicide. The third, Kyla Mae Dunn, was acquitted. Darla Wilson called Don Marie shortly before she hung herself and threatened her. Provincial Court Judge Jill Ronthwaite ruled that it was clear the accused gave Don Marie reason to believe her life was in danger. Ash Hafner Ash was 16 years old and lived in North Carolina. She identified both as LGBTQ and more specifically as transgender. In grade 8, she identified as lesbian. The bullying began with this as a starting point. Not only was she bullied, but some of her friends' parents disallowed them from being friends with Ash. In grade 9, Ash became gender questioning. She once wrote a note about the topic. This is a quote from that note. He, she, it, thing. Be so quick jumping to labels. My pronouns do not define me. But when you ask me if I'm a boy or a girl, I don't know how to answer. 
I haven't even identified yet. So just leave me alone and call me Ash. In her spare time, she wrote poems and songs. Ash cut her hair short, and the bullying intensified. It became more than she could withstand. And on February 26, 2015, she warned friends through text messages that she intended to commit suicide. Her friends told Ash's mother. Her mother rushed down and saw a crowd on the street. Ash jumped in front of a car during rush hour. A vigil was held in her honor at Porter Ridge High School. Her mother later became an anti-bullying activist. The recorded versions of Ash's songs were uploaded to YouTube. The following was written on Ash's laptop soon before her death. If I die, I don't want to be remembered as the faggot gay girl with all the scars on her arm. Unfortunately, that's who I am to a lot of people. If those people would have just stayed silent and kept their ignorant thoughts in their heads, then maybe I wouldn't have those scars on my arm. Maybe. It wasn't always about what they had in their heads. It was what was inside of mine, too. I just didn't understand why I felt the way I did when I had a decent life. I may have come from a broken family, but I always had a roof over my head and a loving mother who fully accepted me for who I was and never stopped trying. She was the only person who never gave up hope on me. But anyway, I don't want to be remembered as the girl with problems. Just remember me as someone who understood and stayed strong for as long as I could. Phoebe Prince Phoebe was 15 years old and born in Bedford, England. She later moved with her family to South Hadley, Massachusetts. Phoebe was ridiculed and bullied for several weeks following disputes with two girls. Her aunt warned school officials that she was susceptible to problems like peer pressure and bullying. She was harassed in the library and school auditorium. One of them followed her home from school in a friend's car, threw an empty can at her, and insulted her. She was unable to handle the stress anymore and hung herself in the stairwell leading to the second floor of her family's apartment. Her body was found by her 12-year-old sister. A memorial page was created for her on Facebook. Several crude comments were posted on it. Most of them were removed. The six teens accused of bullying Phoebe were themselves subjected to bullying and death threats after Phoebe's death. Rebecca Ann Sedgwick Rebecca was 12 years old and lived in Lakeland, Florida. Rebecca was a very troubled girl. She struggled with depression and anxiety. She engaged in self-mutilation by way of cutting. The cutting got out of hand on one occasion, and she was hospitalized for three days. After she returned to school, there was a bullying incident with a student, and her parents decided to have Rebecca homeschooled. Her mother deactivated her social media accounts and confiscated her cell phone. Rebecca later returned to public school. She attended a different school than before. Her cell phone privileges were restored, and she opened accounts on such services as Kick, Ask.fm, and Voxer. Screenshots of comments that were sent to Rebecca on Ask.fm later emerged. Some examples... Nobody cares about you. You seriously deserve to die. Drink bleach and die. Rebecca began to entertain suicidal thoughts a year before her death. She entered new conflicts with other students around the time when she was withdrawn from public school in February 2013. A search of Rebecca's cell phone and computer revealed internet searches that went like what is overweight for a 13-year-old girl, and how much Advil do you have to overdose in order to die? There were photos of Rebecca with razor blades lying on her arms in her cell phone. The wallpaper of her phone consisted of a picture of her resting her head on the edge of a railroad track. Shortly before her death, she changed her moniker on one of the cell phone apps to That Dead Girl. 
She texted a friend who lived in North Carolina, saying to her, I'm jumping. I can't take it anymore. A week before she died, she received messages on her phone asking her why she was still alive and told her to kill herself. September 9th, 2013, Rebecca was found dead after jumping off an abandoned cement plant. September 17th, 2013, 12 year old Caitlin Roman and 14 year old Guadalupe Shaw were charged with aggravated stalking and were accused of bullying Sedgwick during an argument over a boy. The charges were dropped due to a dearth of evidence. In closing, I have a confession. One of the worst things about being bullied was that I was brainwashed. Brainwashed into thinking the things the bullies were saying were true. Yes, but unfortunately they convinced me of something else that was unpleasant and untrue. That bullying is normal and acceptable behavior. Everybody seemed to be okay with it. I was sometimes ridiculed in front of crowds. My name and presence were a punchline. It was rare when any of my peers objected to it. Even though I was hurt deeply by the bullying, I was bamboozled into thinking it was normal, and I said and did things to other kids that hurt them. I was misled into thinking it was funny and that it would elevate me in the social hierarchy, where, at a loftier position, I would escape the worst of the harassment. I was wrong on both counts. I still remember the things I said and did to those kids. I hope and pray that they have forgotten. I live with profound shame and remorse to this day. Do I have the excuse that I was young and naive? It is certainly true that I wouldn't even consider behaving in those ways now. If the victims remember, perhaps they might derive satisfaction in knowing that I am still beating myself up for what I did to them. I have other questions. Should we accept that everywhere in life we will encounter a pecking order which is sometimes brutal and merciless in its tactics of exclusion? Are men who were damaged by bullying a bunch of pussies who need to man up? Who is to blame besides the perpetrators? The parents of the bullies? The schools? What can be done about cyberbullying, which occurs outside the jurisdiction of the schools? All I can say is that there is something terribly wrong with our world when a 12-year-old starts talking about committing suicide. It's just not right. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.